This is All India Radio Mangaluru. Dear listeners, in today's Talk in English program, we now bring you a talk, War That Goes On, by Dr. Gautam Josna. Stanley Kubrick was born on 26 July 1928. This year is situated right between the two world wars. Born at such a crucial period of time, Stanley Kubrick had the great fortune to witness as well as explore the political, psychological, social and cultural changes taking place during this period. His parents were of Jewish origin but were not strictly religious. In the early age of adolescence, Kubrick was always fascinated with the game of chess. He was a master chess player, a passion which shaped his unique artistic control as a director. The game of chess itself is a theatrical representation of war. Kubrick's enormous interest in the game of chess made him to adopt themes related to war in most of his major films. His very first film Fear and Desire is set in the middle of a war. Although the film does not specifically mention the name of the war, it alludes to the Second World War as well as war in Korea which was taking place when the film was being made. The film reflects the dangers of war and how brutally it destroys human compassion. It narrates the ever existing structures of fear, doubt and death which are the products of the modern world ridden with wars. It tells the story of four soldiers dangerously trapped within enemy lines. Sergeant Mack, Lieutenant Cobby, Private Sidney and Private Fletcher are the four men who are lost in the jungle. From the very beginning, Kubrick establishes the idea that war dehumanizes men. After attacking and killing several enemy soldiers so that these men can take their supplies and make a raft to escape from the zone of death, the soldiers encounter a woman. Mac, one of the soldier who is eager to attack, captures her and she is tied to a tree and Sidney, his companion, stands guard while others go back to work on the raft. Although it was Kubrick's first attempt at directing, he portrays the encounter between the woman and Private Sidney, who is the embodiment of fear and paranoia created by the modern war as the encounter between modern man of war and nature. She was happily fishing in the Sirin Lake before she is captured. She is the reflection of nature. She appears as if she is close, almost an inseparable fragment of nature. The natural joy and bliss which human beings feel on being one with nature is represented through her character. She has no fears of enemy attacks nor is she eager to escape from the forest even though there is a war going on for she belongs to the forest. But in the company of Sydney, she is traumatized beyond her wildest imagination. She does not speak English nor does she understand it but Sydney begins to confess all the thoughts that had been bothering him until now. The woman appears to him like a savior with whom he can express his thoughts as never before did he find a chance to do that with his superiors. Even though she miserably fails to understand him, Sidney becomes very stubborn and expects her to understand his blathering. Sidney's incapability to communicate his emotion and his repressed fears and desire reflect the idea that a man returning from war does not know the language of love and affection. In short, the language of humanity which was evolved from nature. Fear and desire elaborates how war destroys a soldier's sanity and makes them incommunicable. Private Sidney is the perfect embodiment of man whose sanity has been destroyed by the unnatural or man-made war and as a consequence he is totally incommunicable. The war has dehumanized him. His fear of getting killed in an unknown battle as an unknown soldier has taken away his spirit. He is full of doubts and anxieties. All such fears and paranoia result in Sidney shooting the woman when she tries to run away from him. He kills her because he is afraid that she would report to the enemy general. For a few minutes ago, in a desperate hope to entertain her, he had made fun of the general. Now he is worried and seriously believes his own preposterous fears and firmly feels that the woman who a little while ago appeared like his saviour would speak against him. This fear is baseless and lacks credibility. Once her death is acknowledged, he goes totally insane. He calls himself a fish which implicates that he is denying to accept the reality which is before his eyes. For that reason, he creates an alternative reality in which he has lost his real identity. His pathetic state is the dire consequence of man killing something that could have been his saviour. These self-destructive tendencies speak on the situation of a modern man where 
he has become the enemy of his own self. The worst battle that he has to fight occurs inside his mind. Sergeant Mack is in sharp contrast to the character of Sidney. He is eager to prove that his life has meaning. So, he hopes to go on a mission in which he and the rest of the soldiers can attack and kill the enemy general. But Kubrick subtly hints that even Mack is committing philosophical suicide as Albert Camus argues in the work Myth of Sisyphus which takes on man's encounter with the absurd. Mack is afraid that in the war he would lose his individuality, his life would lose meaning. Therefore, to attach meaning to his existence, he desires the death of the general. Private Fletcher agrees to go along with his plans because he hopes that this might help the cause for which they are fighting the war. But that's not what Mack has in mind. He wants to recreate an air of importance around his persona and this particular action would help fulfill his longing. Their efforts appear to be futile because even before Mack could get near to the headquarters of the general, he is shot and severely wounded by the soldiers guarding the enemy general. His death appears like an attempt to create meaning for his life. He becomes a part of the war in which he had witnessed nothing but killing. People from either side had killed and were killed. He did not understand this absurdity. Therefore, as he is lying on the raft, heavily wounded, he utters, I quote, Nobody is going to cry for me later or cheer for me now. Nobody else is me. I know that. It was all wrong. Ah, good riddance. What a trade. Him for me. I unquote. In the last moments of his life, Mac realizes or at least recognizes what he had refused to until now. That killing human beings for a great cause in a great war is wrong. It has no meaning. However, earlier, Sergeant Mac could not endure the burden of awareness which would open him up to the world of absurd where no actions of human beings would create any meaningful result in a violent act like war. For that reason, he chose to forcibly enforce a purpose with a faint hope to suppress this awareness of absurdity. If Sidney creates an alternative imaginary world that would take him away from the harshness of reality, Mac relies on the false idea of purpose to escape from the world of absurd in which he is caught up. Lieutenant Corby has the awareness of the absurdity. Just as Albert Camus argues in the myth of Sisyphus, not only does the lieutenant recognize the absurdity of their situation, but tries to create his own meaning as well. The meaning in this sheer absurd struggle for Corby is to survive. He has no taste for the high plans of Mac. He is aware that going on a mission to destroy General would be fatal. He does not want to waste his life on such suicidal mission, nor does he desire to be a part of a greater purpose which would bring honor and legacy to one's life. His life is precious, yet at the same time, he does not have any particular reasons to feel so. In an internal monologue, we hear him confessing what makes his life so precious. I quote, Why? The only reason is to hunt for the reason. I unquote. But at the same time, he is not a coward and eventually agrees to go with Mac's plan as he respects Mac's purpose. When he finally kills the general, neither does he feel proud nor patriotic. He performs this action almost indifferently. There is a sense of detachment in his act. He realizes that war is absurd and no higher purpose can be served through killing. The men who return to their camp are not sure whether they really came back from the war or not. When Fletcher wonders whether Mac is coming back from the forest or not, in a detached tone the lieutenant replies, I quote, not sure yet whether even we have come back. I think we have gone too far from our own private boundaries to be certain about these things anymore, to come back to ourselves. I unquote. The root cause of such a state of despair and uncertainty is the greater disillusionment that war brings for humanity. Men like the lieutenant realizes that soldiers are not killing monstrous enemies to make the world a better place. On the contrary, they are killing fellow human beings. To endorse this idea more boldly, Kubrick makes the same actor play the characters of the two generals. The enemy general is not an overconfident, bloodthirsty monster with a desire to destroy all of his enemies. On the contrary, he is a sympathetic figure who is afraid that he might get killed any time. It's the biggest paradox of the war that his own double kills him. Kubrick offers the idea that after the war, the defeated are already dead 
and the victorious do not feel the sweet taste of victory for after being aware of what they have done they become fearsome strangers to themselves even though the movie was released in the early 50s when the second world war had ended and had destroyed the sense of hope and bliss from fellow human beings kubrick's fear and desire does not offer a pessimistic conclusion there is a glimpse of hope at the end in the post climax every character even sydney to some extent dares to confront his real individual self no matter how grotesque that experience was ultimately they manage to retain their individuality even though all of them have participated in the same war this confrontation and this predication bring them closer to their true selves in the very beginning of the film in the voice over an unknown narrator makes it clear that forest in which the war takes place is outside history the statement that comes next acts as a paradox to the idea raised in the former i quote only the unchanging shapes of fear and doubt and death are from our world these soldiers that you see keep our language and our time but you have no other country than the mind i unquote even after making such a declaration that it is a fictional work the fiction is not free from the affectation of the real modern world which is infested with fear of mass destruction and self doubt after the second world war the symbolic portrayal of the two soldiers who survive yet fail to come out of the traumatic experience of the war in the end represent not only the state of europe after the devastating experience of the second world war but at the same time it acts as the after effects of any internal war that goes on in the psyche of the human beings of the modern world fear and desire was released in 1953 almost 7 decades earlier nevertheless the film carries a prophetic vision as it foreshadows our conflict ridden current times whether the war occurs between two countries or between two ideologies clashes have become very common during our age although fear and desire was kubrick's first film he was still trying to address matters that transcend time and space what makes the film still relevant is that rather than endorsing or denouncing the institution of war kubrick attempts to elaborate on how war permanently distorts our perception of reality thus destroying the human mind's ability to comprehend everyday occurrences dear listeners you have just heard a talk war that goes on by dr gautam josna this talk came to you from the studios of all india radio mangaluru